Well, good afternoon, everyone. This is Dr. Jacqueline King, and I am here with Pastor Rich Brown, an amazing man of God here in Fort Wayne, the pastor of Abundant Life uh, Apostolic Church. Yes, and um, I've actually been visiting, and I, I told him I wanted to have a conversation with him because I'm so impressed with, uh, first of all, the size of the church, the diversity of the church, the mission of the church, and how the people really show genuine love. So Pastor Brown, how are you doing today? Doing fantastic, Ms. King. It's such an honor to be here with you and to spend a little time visiting today. Well, um, we're excited to to hear your story. For First of all, uh, I'd like to know, I'd like to go personal. So how did you go into the ministry and when did you know that there was a call on your life? Uh, I had the blessing of being raised in the home of a pastor. And my father pastored um, for 34 years, and then he became um, kind of a denominational superintendent uh, for the state that he was in. And so I, I saw church up close and personal from my earliest memories and um, always had an affection or affinity towards um, uh, pastoral ministry and just sort of a, maybe a disposition and uh, appropriate strengths that, um, that caused me to have an interest. Um, there was a certain point when I had to deal with the uh, idea of, is this really my calling or is this just what seems natural because I was raised in a pastor's home? And that's probably one of the things that I had to wrestle with and as such begin to pursue uh, secular education, secular degree, even working in the secular world for a while, uh, but always knew inside that, that, that God had, had put his fingerprints on me. And then I had a couple of um, uh, confirmations from prophetic voices in my childhood and adolescence that um, kind of helped me deal with, with those questions regarding, is this just uh, something that happens automatically or naturally, or, or am I really called of God to do this? So that's how I got started. I taught school for a little bit and uh, was um, on the pathway to becoming an attorney prior to that. Oh, so, wow. um, uh, so I've a little bit of all types of ministry from running bus ministry outreach to youth ministry um pastoring a smaller congregation in california that grew and then uh, here in fort wayne so i'm really blessed that that's interesting that you would say that because i know a lot of people um don't want to start at the bottom you know the cleaning the bathrooms or mm -hmm. uh you know uh so was that easy for you or did you want to go right to the top? Uh, you know, I, I was blessed with um, parents who um, raised me not to expect or to um, uh, to feel entitled for anything like that. Um, it was expected that we would um, do the, the, the lowest or the most menial uh, responsibilities and see it as a privilege and an honor. Um, I, I think that's I can't attribute any of that to myself. It's it's just that I was raised the right way, you know, and I was taught um, not to anticipate or expect anything. And I think my father, in an effort not to be nepotistic, was almost overboard the other direction. But sitting here today at almost 50 years of age, I'm grateful for it. I'm thankful that I didn't come in with the assumption that um, uh, that uh, I was going to just automatically be in a, in a position of um, uh, great authority or honor right off. So do you believe that a lot of the kids today uh, feel entitled because of their parents? Yeah. Once again, it all depends on the individual parent that's, um, that's raising the child. Uh, but that is a problem. Uh, I, I see that there's perhaps a, uh, a lack of uh, a sense of it's going to take hard work. I'm going to have to really maybe have some failures in the, in, before I have the success and kind of learn. Uh, learn things. And I think um, perhaps people are conditioned to be a little discouraged too easily and kind of quit and give up uh, rather than automatically coming in, assuming, you know, I'm going to have to learn how to do this. It's going to be some rough road and um, I'm not going to always succeed. And, uh, uh, but, um, but yeah, to, to, to your original question, I think there may be, may be something to that, but I also think that there are still good parents that are raising their kids the right way and uh, teaching them, you know, that they got to uh, be honorable in the home, uh, be honorable to their siblings, be honorable to other church members. And when they practice honor, then God says, okay, I can, 
I can position you to to be a keeper of people and a shepherd. That's that's awesome. So how old were you when you actually started preaching? You know, um, I was thinking the other day, I preached, I believe, my first sermon at about, I was 16 or 17 years of age, and it was a youth revival. And a, a friend of mine who was a youth pastor at this little little tiny church out in the country, um, he's gone on to do great things. He's a pastor now and also a medical doctor. Oh, wow. And uh, But he invited me to come speak to his youth group. And so I came out there to preach and uh, obviously just did the best that I could. And But I'll never forget, he came up afterwards and he handed me a check. And said, hey, we, we just wanted to give you a little something to help you gas money getting over here and so forth. And this was um, uh, 1988, 87, something like that. I opened it up and it was a check for $50. And I was like, I'd never seen that much money in my whole life. <laughs> I, I was working for $7 an hour. And uh, I remember just being smitten with that. And I, I went back to my friend Clay and I said, um, you know what? I can't receive this. God's blessed me with a job. And uh, I'm just honored to do this. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity. And I gave it back to him. And he said, no, no, we want we want to bless you. We, we, we intend to do this. We want to bless you. And I said, Clay, I absolutely cannot. And he said, okay, well, take it back. But this better be the last time you ever do that. <laughs> wow. So, wow, that's a, that's a first for me. <laughs> <laughs> so do you think that, um, I mean, I know that, pastors get paid do you think that some preachers overdo it when uh, it comes to money yeah i mean i i think we could all agree with that 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 sometimes uh some preachers are overcompensated but i will say that the majority of pastors and ministers are radically undercompensated and so it's it's unfair to like lump everyone together um um, but um, those who are gifted and those who um, attract a lot of people with that comes, um, you know, additional remuneration. Um, and at that point, a person has to, has to number one, have good voices in their life that will speak truth to them, uh, truth tellers, and um, just a, a tremendous amount of self-control. Um, and, um, and also just a recognition that, um, um, that our, our, our gifting is, is from God. It's not, it doesn't make us special. It's just God's given us particular gifting, just like he's given other people in the church, um, uh, unique giftings. And, um, it, it's not a, I think sometimes ministers will get this sense that because they can really move people, uh, because they can influence people that, oh man, you know, I must have this special connection or relationship with God. It's not true. It's just you have a gift. And um, uh, and I read something the other day that just like completely impacted me um, about the inner man, how that um, in order um, for us to finish well, and that's, that's my goal is not to just have success, but to finish well. Um, in order to finish well, you, you have to focus on the invisible part of your life, the part that nobody sees. Uh, the inner garden, I guess you would call it, where, where you meet with God and have a relationship with God. And um, people who are very gifted have a problem with this because they're able to influence and move people without tending the inner garden. And it leads to an ultimate collapse. And we've seen a lot of those. Sadly, we've seen a lot of those. But what the point that this book was saying is that um, sometimes unassuming members of churches assume they're being... Uh, they're being led by a spiritual giant when really they're being manipulated by a spiritual mm. ninja with a gift. Is that unbelievable? Yeah. That wow. That's deep. That I was like, wow. So it's like, uh, uh, I think a, a person with a lack of self-control in terms of their own spending, their own lifestyle, sh uh, not that we're supposed to sit around and judge people, but it does sh show us that maybe there's some tending of the inner garden that that's not happening. And, and it's, it's scary because when, when someone like that collapses, a lot of good, uh, unassuming, sincere people are impacted in the fall. Wow, that's that's pretty heavy. Uh, one of the things that attracted me to you and your wife, because I don't know a whole lot of people here, is your humility. 
talk about that because I mean it shows through and and I you know I watch and everything you do it really does. I really I really appreciate that and uh, uh, one of the things that I know that is is it's possible to affect humility which means put on a show of that and um, uh, you know we sincerely don't want to do that in any way but I think part of it is God was gracious to me and, and I look back and I, I say why God why were you so kind to me because I saw other friends who really in their early years, late twenties or early thirties were really promoted to, because of their gifting, they were exposed and, uh, um, and, and celebrated. <clears throat> and then came the breaking time, which God has to do in every ministry after the blessing comes a, a, a breaking so that God can really, really use us. And um, in the case of some of these young men it's when that season came it's like okay i'm not up for this like and many of them are not in ministry today or they've gone a different direction but i was blessed to minister during that season of my life in relative obscurity and um and and i don't know if you've heard this before but um somebody said if you know the old school way that they used to develop pictures they did it in the dark room mm -hmm. and um if uh if a picture was exposed to the light too soon, um, it would be ruined. And um, I think um, some people get too much exposure too early. Mm -hmm. And uh, and as a result, um, when it comes time for God to do the breaking so that he can really use us, he can really, really use us to impact, um, uh, it, it doesn't work. So I would say I, I'm blessed of God in that I, I I um, ministered in relative obscurity through that season. And then, you know, we started seeing some success and, 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 and being very encouraged and excited, maybe even proud. And then uh, we hit the wall and watched God kind of uh, teach us a few lessons. And uh, I, I really believe this, this is a powerful point that, that really has uh, worked in my life over the last couple of years is um, um, once again, I talk about the secret garden, the relationship with God. Uh, prayerlessness is a sign of pride, mm. like like greater than any any other side. When we think of pride, we think of maybe arrogance or, or cockiness or somebody that looks down on other people. And while that may be um, some of the fruits of pride, pride is really a sense that I can figure this out. I can handle on my own. And uh, if I get up and go out into my day without casting my cares on the Lord and surrendering completely to my need of him, acknowledging that God, I can't even get through this day without you. Um, then, then what I'm saying is, God, I got this. I can handle this. And if I need you, I'll come see you. But mm. um, th that is, um, um, it's interesting in the passage where it says, humble yourself before God and he will exalt you. And it's like, okay, well, how do I do that? Well, look at the very next verse. The very next verse says, casting your cares on him because he cares for you. So a, a lot of times in ministry, many of us feel anxiety and pressure and stress. You know what that's a sign of? It's a sign of us carrying our cares instead of casting it on him. If every morning we get up and we cast our cares on him. That doesn't mean we're lazy and we don't address the things that need to be addressed. But it means that at, at, from the beginning day to the end of the day, we know that it, it rises or falls on God's favor and blessing. I'm just going to do what I'm told to do. It's not even my church. It's his church. And so... Um, by having that uh, mentality, um, and if I go out into my day, somebody else said the other day, a, a man who attends our church who was over 40 years um, uh, addicted to alcohol so badly uh, that his life was destroyed, and uh, he had tried to quit. He was from a church background, and he had tried to quit, he said, over 100 times. And when, he, when it finally hit, he was... Uh, 52 years of age and he checked himself into the hospital and um, I'll spare you the details but this is the one thing that he said he said from that moment to this day it's over five years now he said I have not walked out of my house one time without falling on my knees and begging God to help me that day and acknowledging that I can't do this without you he said guess what it works guess what else it expires in exactly 24 hours and I have to get down again. Isn't that powerful? I love that. That is 
Oh, that's, that is very powerful. Um, so one of the things that, I mean, you know that I've been in church all my life and mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I've had a problem with is people putting the pastor on a pedestal. Sure. Is it his or her responsibility not to allow that to happen? Uh, that's that's good. Good question. And I think it's kind of um, there's a ditch on either side um, uh, because uh, I, I operate under the um, uh, value system that um, a church or, or God's kingdom is built on honor, just like the scripture says, honor your uh, father and mother that your days may be long on the earth. So it's the only commandment that has a reward or a promise attached to it. And it's talking there about honoring authority, which would be parents. You know, our parents are in the in the household, in the physical sense, our authority. And by showing them honor, that means to recognize them as valuable, recognize them as worthy of esteem, as weighty, not cheap or chintzy. And in the scripture, it also says that we ought to um, uh, we ought to regard our brother as um, um, more worthy of honor than ourselves. So, um, so once again, a ditch on either side uh, of the road of not being willing to honor authority. And usually people who honor authority don't have honor in their life anywhere. They really don't. And so God's blessing is removed from them. Um, now, um, on the flip side is the, the uh, tendency perhaps of spiritual authority or people in positions of, of high regard or recognition to only understand honor coming up. That means people regarding and respecting and valuing uh, authority and leadership. But there's a there's a powerful passage that that talks about um, uh, when Jesus sent out his disciples. He said, "When people receive you, they're receiving me, and when they receive me, they're receiving him that sent me." That's Jesus speaking as a man about, "Hey." When, when people receive my message, for, for instance, when I go into Nazareth and they honor and receive me, they're honoring God. And then he told the disciples, when they honor you, they're honoring me, and by extension, honoring God. And there's a reward that comes when we show that kind of um, honor and, and value to those in, in a position of connection with God. But then he goes on to say, if you receive a prophet, in the name of a prophet, you'll receive a prophet's reward. So that means when you honor spiritual authority or those who speak um, uh, words and direction into your life, then you receive a reward for showing that honor. Then he says, if you honor a righteous man in the name of a righteous man, you receive a righteous man's reward. Now, that would be not a position of authority. That would be like a fear, right? So you're, you're showing honor, not just to people in spiritual authority, but to peers as well. And then it says, even those who give a cup of cold water to a child shall in no wise lose their reward. So a child would be somebody who is under authority. So this is the beautiful thing about, uh, about the word of God, about the kingdom of God. It's all based on love, is that we love and show honor to authority, uh, both uh, you know, in, in a physical sense, um, uh, positions of authority in, in, in the community in the state, country, city, we, we show honor there. But then we also uh, prefer our brothers, which means show not, not just saying, oh, I love him, but we really love him by showing honor and deference to them. Uh, th that would be our peers. And then where it really gets amazing is when we can honor those who are under us, under our spiritual authority. And when, when I say honor them, that means treat them as valuable, treat them as weighty, significant. Uh, um, uh, and, and, and show that type of regard. And um, so I think, I really think to answer your question, when as a leader, if I show honor to peers and if I show honor to people who are under me, there's going to be a balancing of things. But if I just receive and absorb honor and don't show it, then things get out of balance. And um, And so rather than me having to say, hey, I'm just another man, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to put me on a pedestal. 
when I will honor the people who are not in positions of authority and show them as being more valuable than me, then it takes care of itself. I really think it takes wow. care of itself. That's deep. <laughs> uh, I like that. So um, another thing is you moved from California mm -hmm. um, here, and that was a major transition for you. Yeah, absolutely. Talk about that from that church to this, because it looks like it was like night and day. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's um, a, a little bit different that um, in California, the culture was different. Um, the people that we were ministering to, uh, just a, a different um uh, intensity of life, uh, cost of living, all of these things were were so different. But to, for us, probably the biggest difference is we had pastored there for 17 years and taken a church that was relatively small, and we saw it grow. And so our um, congregation, our staff, our leadership, um, our volunteer leaders, our volunteer teams were majority of those who um, came into the church or developed a relationship with God or were born again while we were there and so we were able to to really invest in discipling these people and their our fingerprints were all over their lives for better or for worse and um so there was just a, a closeness and a kinship there and um my wife and i had committed ourselves to basically serve there to our retirement and we felt like that's what god had called us to be and we had opportunities over the years to take maybe a larger more established congregation somewhere back the Midwest, which is where we're from, uh, but we we felt we, we knew for beyond all shadow of doubt that God had called us there, and um, we both felt peace and clear direction when we went there. I was 30 years of age; my wife was only 26 at the time, and so we we pastored there, um, developed relationships, uh, were well established within the, the church community there, and um, so when it came time for this move to happen. Um, I had an elder in my life that said, uh, well, my, my father had always said to me, first of all, that um, you, you don't leave unless God gives you clear direction. You stay put. Mm -hmm. And uh, even if things are uncomfortable, even if things are um, not going well, uh, you, you, uh, you don't leave. Another thing my dad always says is if, if God is calling you to leave, he's not going to call you to leave in the middle of a disaster. He's going to kind of leave when things are going well. Uh, but the other elder that I mentioned, he said um, he went through a similar situation. They had to come back to his hometown um, and and assume the pastorate of his home his home church after having pastored in in, in a, a, a contemporary edgy community and and, and building a, a church of his own there. And he said, I never would have left, but he said the Lord dropped a billboard right in front of me to let me know if it was time. And so he told me, he said, if, if there's no billboard drops, it doesn't matter who tells you to go. But if the billboard drops from heaven, basically, then it doesn't matter who tells you to stay. And so my wife and I experienced that um, uh, a very, very clear way that the Lord let us know um, that it was time. And um, at first I was very resistant, um, not because I had anything against Fort Wayne. Uh, it's just we had poured so much of our lives in there and we were seeing a certain measure of success and to be able to, 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 to step away from that and hand all of those babies over to someone else. Uh, I say babies, I mean, spiritually new ones that we had nurtured. Um, it was just, um, it was really a difficult time. I had, a, had a friend that went through a similar experience and what's amazing is we were talking about that experience. And as we were, Kind of sh shared with the congregation that we were leaving, which was like a, a funeral, <laughs> and then uh, um, help sought to help them find a successor, a pastor to lead. Uh, it was perhaps, and we didn't realize it, one of the most stressful things we had been through. And so we had a good laugh with each other when we found out that both of us, at the same stage, ended up in the ER getting our heart checked to make sure that we weren't having an episode. <laughs> Uh, because the, the, the symptoms of, of kind of the pressure in that moment. So it's big, just like anybody that would move from one place to another, it's a big thing. But then you multiply the fact that all of these people um, were depending on you, you were their spiritual father. So um, that's been that's been a big thing. <laughs> okay, so fast forward to here, Abundant mm -hmm. Life. 
huge church. Mm -hmm. I mean, huge. <laughs> uh, how was the adjustment? Um, you know, the adjustment is a, is still a work in progress. Um, it's, um, uh, you know, as you imagine in your mind what it's going to be like in terms of interfacing with um, the leaders and the staff, um, it's, uh, it ends up not being the way kind of that you anticipated. There's a lot of things that you didn't uh, factor in as you, as you begin this transition in. And one of the things that kind of was maybe a positive is that we transitioned um, in the middle or towards the, the second half of the, the, the COVID surge. And so um, the church here, many of their, uh, pro, much of their programming had not been functioning. And um, a lot of their systems were kind of broken down a little bit. Uh, and um, the, the, uh, my uh, predecessor, who's also my wife's dad, had been um, trying to transition out for, for several years. He's 75 when he, when he finally retired from 74, 75. And uh, so when you're in a transition uh, frame of mind, it's hard to speak vision and give direction. So uh, he would be the first one to tell you that, um, that he had kind of been checked out. Uh, so what that did is that left kind of a lot of things not happening and kind of allowed for us to come in and recreate um, and to refresh systems. But secondly, is to, to try to re-engage membership and ministry who had just been sitting on the sidelines. And um, so <laughs> I likened it like um, my wife and I coming in here is almost like a wrecking ball or a bomb, just like everything is all over the place. And now we're reassembling um, the, the, the pieces we're talking about. No, we're not talking about the membership or the people in the church. We're just talking about the, the, the structure and the way that we disciple people, the way that we get new people connected to the church. We're, we're, we're putting the pieces together and um, our staff. Uh, of the church has been very patient with us as we've sought to be with them uh, of a completely different style of leadership, um, different approach, different vision. And, um, but um, the, the people in the church have been very warm and welcoming and, and we're blessed in that. My, uh, they've known us for a long time and, and my wife even grew up in this church. So it's not like we're complete strangers going in. So uh, it's been exciting. We are, we have some priorities that are very, very important to us that were also important to my father-in-law when he was in his prime. Uh, but um, they, they're, um, it's not like it's something out of left field, but it's some things that haven't been the top of the priority list for a while. So it's like pushing them back up there and also um, kind of shifting the culture to very outward focused, evangelistic, um, not focused on who we're going to keep in the church, but who we're going to reach. That's what we're called to do. I like that. Um, so I, I've told this story to several people, how I ended up here. So I will tell it, it was really interesting because you all had a food trucks on the 4th of July and uh, I was getting an ice cream cone and your wife was getting one too. And she had on this hat that I, I said, oh, I love that hat. And she says, oh yeah, somebody just gave it to me. Then she went, have you been to the church? <laughs> like, no. <laughs> and so she says, well, come Sunday and, and look for me. I said, well, what's your name? She said, Tamara. And I, I come there and, and don't be offended. I said, I look at all these white people. I said, where am I going to find this woman at? She had a mask on. <laughs> I don't know who she is. I thought she'd be a, a greeter or something. And plus, I didn't realize the church was as big as it was. But it was really, she was just so down to earth. And so I told the lady next to me, I said, um, there was a lady that invited me to church and um, I don't know where she is. I said, I think the lady singing on the stage might be her. He goes, oh, that, she goes, oh, that's the pastor's wife. <laughs> and, and it was like, I mean, it was just like so natural to me for, it was so natural for her to do that. That seemed like that's not something that she, that's something that she does on a regular basis. She just reaches out to people. Is that, is that a fact? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, um, just um, connecting with people, loving people, reaching people is 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 our heartbeat. And uh, what we believe is anything that, um, well, I'll put it this way: a church over time picks up the personality and disposition of the leadership. 
And um, so in uh, California, God blessed us with a church that was exceptionally open, welcoming, and embracing of anybody. And so um, it, it was a safe place. There was no gossip. It was just a healthy, healthy environment. And um, so that's, uh, you know, my wife's personality and disposition. And even, like you said, not even knowing that she was the pastor's wife, that's kind of always been my thing. I would go work out at the gym and uh, have a lot of friends there. And none of them knew I was a pastor uh, just because, you know, for some people that's automatically going to put them in a, a, a frame of mind where they're not as comfortable or, or, or they're not real with you. And uh, so that's um, uh, kind of our, our approach is just to try to be, try to be open, you know, and I think that's probably the way Jesus was really. I mean, I'm not saying we're like Jesus, but that's who our pattern is. That's who we're trying to be like. And right. he, he just was like, everybody, people liked him. People wanted to be around him. He, he, he didn't make them feel badly. He made them feel wow, I want, to, I want to spend some time here. So um, that's kind of our passion as well. That's, that's really awesome. And I know um, I've spent a little time with some of the uh, political leaders here, and I know that the diversity here, especially African-American, is very low. It's like 13%. Right. <laughs> uh, but you do have diversity in the church. Is that important to you? Yeah, it's very important. It's very important. Um, my... Um, children were raised i have three three daughters the oldest is 20 the youngest is 11 and then i have a, a 16 year old in the middle um they were raised in california and um so um diversity within the church is not an anomaly in california it's just the way it is it's a melting pot and uh so that's all that they've known that i grew up in the south in the uh <laughs> you know i think we were talking about how sunday sadly was the most segregated day of the week mm -hmm. and so i grew up um in that milieu but uh pastoring for the last 17 years in a very diverse church it's just number one obviously it's what, what heaven is going to be like made up of diversity of people but i think it creates a a richness in the way that the church serves and ministers and worships it's almost like if w without diversity um, like let's say you have an inheritance and your inheritance is diversified through all of these different types of investments and so mm -hmm. forth, but you only tap into one aspect of that diversified investment. Think of all of the inheritance that you haven't tapped into. And so the same is true in terms of the anointing, the giftings within the church. If, if, you're, if, if uh, your inheritance is limited, and I believe this in, in, is true. The Bible says of husbands and wives um, that a husband is to... Um, to honor his wife, first of all, love his wife as the, the weaker vessel, just physically, um, men have more strength than, than women. But then it says, as as joint heirs in, in God's inheritance. And that, to me, that means if, if, if I'm married and I'm a leader, and my opinion is the only one that counts, and my voice is the only one that matters, then there is half of the inheritance of God's wisdom of spiritual gifting that's shut down so it's like i'm hopping around with one leg uh in terms of spirit the spiritual inheritance so i see the same thing with uh, uh with age diversity ethnic di diversity it's like a full inheritance of of, of spiritual giftedness and influence and um and, and impact that um that that's very important uh to us here at abundant life and that was the case that's not anything we did that's um, that's a um, kind of a witness to, to the church family, the, my, my successor, Bishop Keller. Um, this has been for, for many years a, a church with just a great variety of uh, um, representation of society and culture in, in, in this community. That, that, um, that's awesome. You, one thing you didn't know about me is I was a diversity recruiter okay. for the electric <laughs> company in uh, New Jersey. And one of the things that we um, we tried to do was to get different opinions, and mm. that's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Because if you have every one, you know, everybody thinking one way, then you're not going to get the ideas and fresh ideas, and and be able to grow the ministry. Because I might not think like you think, and I might bring something to the yeah, table absolutely. that you hadn't thought of. So it's to me that that's a beautiful a beautiful thing, and. Um, 
I know that you have a, a lot of work to do because you haven't been here that long, but I am absolutely certain that you will be successful with the, the way you teach and preach. Um, so I'm going to ask a couple more questions. I know um, in class Sunday you talked about um, discipleship. Talk about that because that seems to be really important to you. And you said that's the, the meat and potatoes yes. of being a Christian. Absolutely. The discipleship is twofold. Number one, it's uh, seeking to become a competent follower of Jesus, imitator of Christ, or um, uh, one who, who um, the image of Christ is, is appearing in us. Uh, but the second part of discipleship is you can't really be a disciple, a true disciple. You can't be like Jesus until you're bringing somebody else along and teaching them to be like Jesus as well. So this is is um, uh, discipleship. When you look at the uh, New Testament model, it was built off of um, Jewish tradition. In the Jewish tradition, it was very common for there to be a rabbi or a teacher and a student. And, and it was like a lifetime thing. It wasn't like, okay, you're going to sit here and I'm going to teach you a few things. Now go do your thing. It was like a lifetime of um, kind of encouragement, oversight, accountability. And then those who were students, then they would become rabbis to others. And so it would be multiplying the influence. And um, I think within Christianity, we've seen more of an emphasis on, um, you know, crusades and soul winning and trying to get a certain number of people who have um, made a statement of faith or been baptized or been spirit field. Um, whereas um, the biblical model is not soul winning, it's discipleship or making disciples. Uh, the thing about the, the shortcoming of soul winning is uh, like it, it kind of implies like a, a game, not a game like that it's fun, but that it has an end result. You either won or you lost. And so a soul winning is like, okay, we scored, boom, it's done. But discipleship is, is not done. It's like something that goes on. And, um, and then with, with discipleship is when you invest in people and teach them to invest in other people, it multiplies instead of addition. Addition, um, if you had a powerful soul winner that could win 100 people a year, after 10 years, that'd be 1,000 people. That's awesome if they stick around. But you have a soul winner that can, or a disciple maker that can make one disciple in a year, and then that person makes a disciple the next year, and then the disciple maker makes another. It's called multiplication. Guess who makes the most in 10 years? A disciple maker who makes one disciple a year. And so um, this um, part of, um, uh, of being like a, a keeper, a uh, shepherd, it's not just the role of a, a um, career pastor or the, the person who's in that role. Um, I believe it's, it's God's will that we all become shepherds. Uh, of, if it's just one person or two people that we're, we're, we're keeping them. When, when I look in scripture, when God was looking for somebody that he can trust with leadership and give anointed position to, um, he, he wasn't as interested in giftedness as he was in a person's interest in being a keeper. For instance, he, he selected uh, David. All the other brothers came in. They were handsome. They had the bearing of leaders, especially Eliab, the oldest. Surely this is the one Samuel thought. God said, nope. And all the boys come out, and God hasn't tapped any one of them. He's like, do you have any more boys? Well, I have one. He's the youngest. He's keeping the sheep. And all of a sudden, um, the wise prophet Samuel said, okay, I, I see now God's looking for a keeper, somebody who's interested, just like David was interested in the health and well-being of those sheep, making sure every one of them got in, making sure they survived and thrived, even though they weren't his sheep, they, they belonged to his father. He said, that's, that's who God wants to anoint. That's who can become a leader. And so the same is true as a pastor. I'm always looking for keepers, somebody that's interested in people and looking out for them. And when somebody misses church, they're the ones that's shooting the text. Hey, I missed you. You know what? That, that's a sign that, that, that they're, um, that they're a keeper, that they understand this concept of discipleship. I love it. I love it. Okay, so um, this is going out. You know, we have millions of followers. It's going out. Now. If anybody wanted to join the church, you want to give the address or if they can see it online, your website. Yes, absolutely. Um, our church is called Abundant Life, Abundant Life Church. We're located um, in Fort Wayne, Indiana. 
Um, our church is on Coliseum Boulevard, 3301 uh, East Coliseum Boulevard. And uh, so that means the big Coliseum in uh, here in Fort Wayne and then uh, Purdue University as you're coming down that road after you pass Purdue. Our church is on the, on uh, the left-hand side. And also you can go to AbundantLifeCares.com. And uh, or even on Facebook, you can look up uh, Abundant Life Church. It has our uh, Bible studies and, and uh, sermons that go on live, but are also archived on there uh, for you to take a look at. And um, we, we would love for um, our, our passion is to help people find real purpose in life and to really step in to serving other people, and making a difference. One of the things I, I found, Dr. King, is that you cannot find true joy and fulfillment in life by focusing on yourself. You have to get your eyes off yourself and try to serve people, try to make a difference in other people's life. And that's where you find joy, your relationships improve, and you actually, um, your life begins to have meaning. So that's our goal. Our goal is not just to see, well, how many people can we fit in this building? How many people can we help find that niche where they can serve and make a difference and 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 see God use them in that thing. That's that's beautiful. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Brown. You have been a, a huge blessing. Uh, I'm sure that our people will be um, blessed by this interview. Actually, it will be on our it'll be on our website. It'll be on our Roku channel, um, and so it'll be everywhere. So uh, thank you again, and thank you for being a you know a true man of God and. The last thing I want to know, do you have any encouragement that you want to share before we wrap this up? Absolutely. And, and before I speak those words, I just want to say thank you so much for this opportunity. And I, I've had a great blessing to have met you and connected with you. And I'm glad God brought you to this city. Fort Wayne, Indiana. God has a purpose for that. Thank you. I, Amen. Um, I just want to say the thing that we've been teaching here at our, at our church is about the power of our speech or our tongue and um, how that we can um, direct our lives. The Bible likens our tongue to a bit in the mouth of a horse or a rudder on a ship. It has the power to determine the direction of a massive, powerful animal with a lot of wild instincts or a ship that has a lot of external influences. So, um, so many people fall into the trap of letting their mouth only uh, reflect or communicate what's on the inside or what's happening on the outside. And so just like that ship that's being shoved around by the winds and circumstances of life, they don't take control. They just let their tongue reflect, kind of almost like the difference between a thermometer and a thermostat. A thermometer just can only explain what's happening. A lot of people only use their tongue to define their turmoil or their frustration or um, their feelings or the condition of their life. And um, I mean, it's, it's appropriate in time and space to let people know how you're feeling, but that's not using your tongue like a bit or like a rudder. When you use your tongue like a bit or a rudder, you don't just describe the conditions, but you can overcome the power of external conditions and those internal demons, if you would, like the, uh, the horse has a wild nature and the man's able to, um, to direct that by putting a bit in the mouth of that horse and overcome those um, carnal or fleshly instincts uh, to provide direction. So the same is true in our lives, that we can um, uh, begin to speak where it is that we want to go. Just like you set the thermostat at 72, and it may be 95 in the room, and but don't get discouraged because you've set the thermostat. You're speaking. This is what's going to happen. This is what God is doing. This is what I'm believing God for. Not just pie in the sky and like, okay, I'm going to get a new a new fancy car. That's one, not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about uh, getting in line with the promises of God's word. I'm going to be healthy. God's going to bring strength to my family. God's going to bless my, my home and, and my kids. It's going to be a great day today. God's going to put the right people in my pathway. You start speaking that way instead of just using your mouth to describe the conditions or your emotions and your feelings, then you can uh, put yourself in, in, in proper direction for your destiny. My destiny is determined by my words and my mouth. And so when I realize that, I realize, man, I've got such power, both negative and positive with my mouth. And so I want to encourage somebody today, 
um, to think about the way that you've been thinking, think about the words that you've been saying and understand that that's putting direction in your life. If it's always complaining or finding fault or murmuring or griping, then uh, uh, whatever trial you're in, you're probably going to stay in a little bit longer than you need to. Um, and you have to be ex even more careful about the way that you're speaking when you are going through tough times, uh, because that's when you're more tempted to get a bad attitude, to get negative. And so you got to use your mouth like, like, the, like the horseman would grab the, the bridle and say, okay, we're going this direction. Like have that kind of force or the, the, the man on the ship during the storm, like take hold of the wheel and say, no, we're not doing that. We're going this direction. And ultimately the Bible says you can't control the tongue. God needs to be involved in the mix. And that's where our relationship with God um, enables us to, to practice this bridling of the tongue uh, to have the direction that we want. So I encourage you, uh, things are, are going to go well. Um, God's in control. It's going to be all right. But just learn to speak faith and speak positive and align your words with the word of God. Amen. Well, thank you again. And we thank everybody for tuning in. Until the next time, this is Dr. Jacqueline King. God bless you. Thank you.